What's up? Welcome to episode number 134 of the People We Love podcast. I'm Adam Choit. If you're new here, what I do is interview people from all walks of life, most often creative types about their lives and careers. The conversation is casual, but I also ask everyone to highlight the people they love, who've inspired them, who've influenced them, who've helped them in their career and in their journey. For more, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's peoplewelovepodcast.com. Please subscribe on YouTube, like the videos, share the videos. I appreciate that. The Instagram handle for the show is at people we love podcast. And I am on Instagram and Twitter as well at Adam Choit, if you want to follow me. And please, of course, uh, be sure to subscribe to whatever uh, to the show on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And of course, uh, five star positive reviews on Apple Podcasts are greatly appreciated too. Um, I wanted to uh, give you guys a heads up about my other podcast, all about the 12 piece blues rock soul powerhouse band, Tedeschi Trucks Band. Um, I do a fan podcast all about them at T E D E S C H I Trucks Podcast on Instagram. Definitely want to check that out if you're into that type of music. Um, I also have a short film out that I wrote and directed. It is on YouTube, it is embedded at the film's website, theeditedmovie.com for that. It's a dystopian psychological satire. I appreciate the support on that front too. I don't want to talk too much about my other projects, my other podcasts and all that stuff. I want to get right into today's episode uh, in a moment. Um, Today's guest is Tyler Yonke, a lawyer and host of the Libertarian Podcast Review podcast. Tyler is originally from Washington State, but has been living in Northern California for quite some time. Growing up, he was a smart kid, but a troubled kid who liked to talk and talk back in class and make the other kids laugh. Eventually, Tyler found uh, many other interests from baseball to music to skateboarding to bike riding uh, competitively. Uh, But throughout his journey, though, and through multiple careers, his family has always been there for him. Mom, dad, wife, kids, everybody. Um, Before we get get into this one, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the video on uh, Tyler's uh, end stutters a little bit here and there. His kids were uh, playing video games during the recording, so that might have slowed down the connection a little bit. I know you're not really supposed to blame uh, the guest for the uh, technical stuff, but uh, I think he's okay with that. And I think the episode turned out very, uh, very good, too. And I don't think it will take away from your enjoyment. Uh, But without further ado, let's just get started. Here's Tyler Yonke. So it's good to see you today, Tyler Yonke. Thank you for uh, joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Adam, for having me on. Oh, I said your last name correctly, right? You sure did. Yeah, one of a few. Yeah, because I've heard I've heard it spoken, but people must really butcher that all the time. Oh, yeah, completely. And and it's kind of a joke, even with my kids. Uh, and but you know, I, I I say if if I cared about how my name was pronounced, I'd have slipped my wrist long ago. I mean, no one's gonna get it right. And you know, when you you go to a restaurant. And you put your name in, and it's just always the first name. It's it's never the last name, right? Because it's never gonna get right. Yeah. It's funny how you say "slit my wrist." I thought you were gonna say I was. I would have changed my name, <laughs> not to slit my wrist. <laughs> there, there is another path, I suppose. No, it, there's pride in those names, you know. So you got to keep it. I, I did have a a friend. I don't know if this is you even want to go down this route, but um, this friend of mine, his last name was uh, Dick, and. He got married, and his wife did not want to take his name because of his last name. And then um, she was an attorney. And then they had kids, and she wouldn't let the kids take his last name. And then finally, he just changed his name to hers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah so I mean, whatever works. A pussy, I guess. not a dick. I guess. Yeah. Well, they, these conversations should have been had probably in in advance. But you live, yeah. you, you live, you learn. I guess. But how are you holding up during whatever year this is? Wait, it's 2022. I'm holding up pretty good. <laughs> no, that's good. Is there something going on that I don't know about? That it's not 2020 still. Um, no, life's going pretty good. I'm. Uh, I got my 10 year uh, wedding anniversary tomorrow, so oh, I'm pretty excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, so that's one of the people I love. It's good that we're in the same time zone on the West Coast. That way, that it doesn't strike midnight yeah. for you like early, and, and, and <laughs> right. you're and you're with me instead of your significant other. Right. Like, it's just screaming at you. How could you be on some podcast with some dude when it's supposed to be our time or whatever? But why don't you tell me more about uh, your background and kind of like where you grew up and 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 you have siblings and then some of that stuff. And I kind of asked for people's kind of earliest memories, even like sounds that jump out at them or what people always tend to remember is like 
them at seven year old being seven years old and looking at photos when they're three and they think they have those three year old memories mm, yeah it's just like memories of from when you were a kid but uh, what, what, tell me about uh, a little bit about your background well i'm 51 so uh, some of those memories are getting a little shaky now uh i grew up in the northwest um a town called walla walla washington i was actually on the oregon side of the border so it's right there it's this little valley it's got three colleges uh, dad had been there. My, my, my dad had been there since he was like six. There's a college. He met my mom there. They just stayed around and, um, it was, a, it was a good life. My parents are still together and they're still alive. I've got two older siblings, two sisters, um, pretty standard white family. Christian went to school there, went to high school in, uh, Monterey Bay, uh, in just South of Santa Cruz, uh, for, went to a private school there for two years. Went back to college, got an engineering degree. I'm just whipping right through all this kind of stuff. I'm going to give you the overview and then we can Yeah, well, then we'll unpack it. Yeah, that's yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I got an engineering degree, went to the University of Colorado, uh, did bike racing, got married, had a kid, moved to California, went to law school, and that's kind of where I got divorced. Uh, have two more kids uh, with my wife. So my current wife, <laughs> uh, I have two kids uh, prior, two kids with her. Well, those are stepkids that have, I've adopted. So, um, Anyway, life's uh, life's good, but that's the overview, and then we could dig into it to it a little bit more. I don't remember if my my first memory, to tell you the truth, I, just a lot of good times with my parents. I remember when I was having um, my first child, I had an uncle, and he said, "Are you you know are you nervous or worried about having kids?" And I had to think about it, and I said, "No." Uh, partly, I had such a enjoyable childhood that it was exciting to me. And I'm, you know, I feel bad for people that I guess don't have those kind of things, uh, but you know, make the best of what you have. But you know, I just had such uh, fun parents. We didn't have a lot of money, but we'd, we'd always do vacations and stuff. Uh, the worst part was growing up with two bigger older sisters. Uh, now I enjoy them, but not, not at the time. <laughs> Did you say you grew up, you were born and like your early years were in Washington or in, in California? Did you say in Washington? So technically there's this town called college place. It's this Walla Walla, but just right across the border is where my parents lived in another wonderful name and town called Milton Freewater. Uh, so that's where they, my parents still live in the same house. we moved in there when I was, uh, one, I think. And, uh, they still have the same place. It's a uh, two acres. It's a beautiful yard. And then they did, they have, um, like uh, weddings and stuff outside. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's where it was. And then I, I didn't come to California until 2000. Okay, when you were obviously in a, a full adult, full adult, adult yeah. full adult at that yeah. point. Yeah, gotcha. What do I mean? What do you What do you remember about uh, you know being elementary school age? What kind of kid were you? You mentioned you had older sisters and you had a lot of fun with your family. But what were what kind of stuff were you into as 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 a kid? I was into trouble. Um, I, I was a good kid and quiet. But I would, uh, I love the laughs. So as soon as first grade was fine, second grade, I started. And, and the problem is I would talk in class. So uh, at school was pretty easy for me. So it wasn't always like, you know, struggling to, to do those kind of things. So my attention span was maybe a little off. And I remember my second grade teacher started to um, point me out. Like, you know, this is what teachers do. They, they, they try to shame you, especially when you're younger, so that you don't, uh, you don't act out, you know, if you're talking to stuff, they'll point you out and say, Hey, Tyler, you know, stop talking and, and make a spectacle of you in the class. Well, that works for a little while until you say something back to the teacher and the whole crowd laughs, the whole, all your classmates. Now you're in a different, you're the power dynamic is shifting where you control all the kids. So second grade, I started getting in trouble. Third grade, I got in trouble so much. It was a private school I went to, I got spanked. Uh, in third grade, I hardly ever saw the outside because I was in trouble all the time. And it was just because I talked all the time in class and talked back to the teachers, um, which I mean, and then I got spanked again in. Um, so I skipped sixth grade and then uh, it was a new class. I got spanked again in seventh grade. And my parents finally just took me to a different school. Uh, so those were problems um, that <laughs> the, wow. I, I was a good kid, though. I mean, I, I say this and I got in trouble, but it really was only for. Talking back, rolling my eyes. I guess maybe I wasn't a good kid. I don't know. Just to, well, well, it sounds like you were, but did I mean? Did you actually have like ADHD before it was cool or something like that? <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, you know, uh, having dealt with some of that with with what I do now, 
um, it's like I'm a family law attorney. So you kind of deal with parents and kids and stuff with ADHD. It's, some of that is where they kids, uh, they don't focus, but one of the telltale signs is that they're not doing well in school. Not doing well in school was never my problem. It was, uh, I was always able to, and maybe that was some boredom. Like I said, I, I decided that I was getting in trouble. Fifth grade was really bad. I was, I literally had my desk against the chalkboard by the teacher. And, but then, you know, she doesn't always pay attention. I could entertain the kids behind me. So um, I ended up just skipping the sixth grade and going right to seventh. And that made it seventh grade a little bit more difficult because I had to focus on, on school for a little bit. But um, yeah, it was crazy times. And, and by the way, now with my kids, as long as they're getting good grades, um, I'm pretty fine with, I wouldn't say them getting in trouble, just uh, being a little bit different. I, I, don't know. I don't know how to describe it. They're, it's they're called thought criminals. Yeah, I was going to say you you don't want to be a hypocrite. There's an in, there's yeah. something inside you that says I cannot be a hypocrite, but you can because they don't know, but they'll find out. I'm sure the true <laughs> yeah. you. They probably know already. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, to psychoanalyze you, I was it yeah, something? Please. Well, it sounded like you had a, you did have a great childhood with your parents and had a lot of fun, but maybe getting attention could have been a little bit challenging in the household with two older sisters. And being the youngest, no one ever gives a shit about the youngest, let alone a, the, a boy with two two girls who, who probably, uh, well, who's the favorite? I, my parents are solid as far as like spreading out the love. So my older sister is six years older than me to the day. We share the birthday. Okay. Really? So your, your psychoanalyzing might come into handy here. I've never given a shit about like celebrating my birthday because it was always all the attention was on her because she, you know, uh, craved it and forced that upon everybody. You know, it's not only her birthday, it's her birthday week. It's close to Mother's Day also. So it's like a month. And so I just never cared. So maybe I was looking for some sort of entertainment. I just love the laughs and I love that kind of stuff. So it's not so much like, look at me. It's like, what can I do to get this reaction and to have people like, you know, make uh, laugh at your jokes or whatever. So I see the early, the early, perhaps even libertarianism ideas and yeah. attitudes starting, right. starting to form, um, for, for sure. What about in your family? Did you make them laugh or did they were like not tolerant of your hijinks or did, or did they encourage it or, or, where did you get this sense of humor from? Was it from one of them, your mom, your dad, or something like that? I don't know. My dad's pretty uh, stoic. I mean, he's just mellow, fun guy. He's, he's going to be funny. My mom's a little uh, more high strung, in control. Uh, she could be funny as well. Uh, we used to do, uh, Friday nights were always a thing. We'd have a big meal at the table, and it was always, and then Saturday as well, friends over or whatever. Um, and I would just make jokes at the table. And my older sister, who was kind of like, a, you know, needed drama or whatever, she loved, she would laugh. She was always my biggest fan. So, um, you know, while this maybe pull for attention between the two of us, she did love to laugh at my jokes. So, yeah, the family, my parents are pretty straight laced, but I mean, the jokes that would happen at the table, uh, kind of raunchy. Uh, it it oh, always wow. kind of. It kind of shocks me looking back, but my, you know, my parents were, they just love that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, <laughs> there was and, some good times. Yeah. And I think by the, again, just like thinking by the time you came along with older sisters, they just gave less shits about the, oh, the small, the, the small stuff, yeah. uh, like, like, uh, crude jokes or, or something like that is what, what I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, completely. So my parents, uh, good sense of humor on both of them and, um, it's still the same way. We, my, my two older sisters, they both live here in California and we just uh, had Thanksgiving up at my uh, middle sister's house, which we always do. She's got a big place and all my nephews and, and, and nieces are there and my kids. And it's still, I can't help, but, and I, and I, I, we went around the table and, you know, said what we're thankful for. And I just said that no one in this house has a filter that I can, I don't go home from Thanksgiving regretting some of the comments that I've done because it, <laughs> everyone is just as bad and so it, it makes it a good time. And so that's uh, it, the tradition continues. I wonder if that's a bit of an, an anomaly when it comes to just like families in general, like being that, not having that much of a filter. Because I feel like, you know, maybe even I have like, the, uh, here's a me, version of me with my friends. Here's a version of me in this subculture. Here's a version of me with my family. But like, it sounds like you guys are just yourselves 100% all the time. And that that's kind of special. Well, I, I must case. say they're all we're, we're, like my, my brother-in-law, um, one of the, well, so almost everybody in my family seems to be in the dental field. My brother-in-law is an orthodontist. 
his wife's a hygienist, my sister's a hygienist, my ex-wife's a hygienist, my other brother-in-law runs the dental dental office. Uh, so they're professional people and they're, you know, when they need to be, they're fine. But when we're together, it's, you, it, you know when to turn the filter on and off, which I think is important, right? So you still have to be that presenting, you know, person not to everybody to, to get a, uh, get your clientele and then, sure. um, yeah, let it fly when you're at home. In what, are you, what are your parents' names? Uh, Bernie and Carolyn. And what are your sister's names? Sherry and Charmaine. <laughs> I like you're looking at the ceiling like you're thinking about it. But you're not <laughs> the like... first person to like do that when yeah. it's, it's different when you're on a show or you're on being recorded or like like every everyone's like watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy screaming how much idiots the people yeah. on the shows are. But then when I, you are you those... calling me an idiot? That's what I'm getting here. That's no, I'm, I'm <laughs> calling. I'm, I'm saying there's a I'm, there's a lot of pressure to to, to perform well on, on oh, this specific I'm podcast. Not, I'm not concerned. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 I don't know yeah. why I had to think about like I I, I think you know what I was thinking was it, it, two things. One is. Um, my sister's names are spelled with a C, both of them. So Sherry is with a C and Charmaine is with a C. And I was like, which one am I going to say first? And then am I going to say anything about their how they're spelled? And I was like, no, nah, i just say them. And then now I've said them both. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I could see that like just like thinking of the names is, leads to other thoughts in your head. Especially yeah. They have like an interesting sound sound. They start alliteration. Is that what you call that? Or something I, like yeah, that? I think so. Yeah, sure. sure why not? What about going into like middle school? Because you said, or, or that's about the time when you um, started to maybe behave better, or you got taken out of a school. Where, where did this? Where does the story go from there? Um, so I skipped sixth grade, went into seventh. Is that kind of what you're talking about when I started when I moved? Yeah, schools? I guess so. Like you were always a good student throughout all of, all of this. Yeah, like, yeah, it, yeah. It wasn't uh, the schoolwork part wasn't a problem. And and I remember my mom telling me at some point she goes, you know, and and. Uh, I don't know if this was good or bad, but she's like, you know, you don't have to, you know, work that as hard as your sisters or something like that to get through school. It just, and I was like, oh, okay. So my mom was basically trying to say in a way of that I was smart. Um, I kind of just always was like, oh, okay. It was like kind of beneficial that, uh, um, you know, she doesn't think I'm stupid or whatever. And so that was <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> but I think I kind of was in the mind of like, oh, then I don't have to necessarily try. And, um, yeah, so I, like I said, I skipped sixth grade. It was more like trying to, the sixth grade teacher had been hell for my sisters, for my cousins that had gone there. So I just knew it was going to be trouble. So my mom just made a, an executive decision and skipped me forward. And so I went into seventh and they had this new teacher, this male teacher, and he was new at the school, but he was also a new teacher and he could not control the students. Uh, so then of course me, I'm Tyler, who's talking and has friends. Uh, I obviously got in trouble and then, um, we just moved me to a different school and that was, that was a good thing as well. So then when I went to high school, the kind of these two schools fed into it. Um, I was friends with everybody. Um, I make myself sound like a bad kid, but, uh, I, I don't know. I was just more of disruptive. I just like to chat. No, yeah. I, I, I follow and I, I, I don't, th I don't think you sound that way. I've talked to a number of people who have sort of similar tracks. It's like, I, 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 I admire that in a way Like you were able to like have fun and get, and get in trouble, which is, which can be fun too, but also <laughs> yeah. maintain the grades. If you're getting the good grades, but you're not getting in trouble, it's like, I don't want to be like that. That person's working so hard. Just, that's, not, that's not my vibe. Right. And if but you're I, getting in trouble and you're getting terrible grades, like I don't want to just get in trouble and I, like, just like ruin my life entirely. But if you get in the grades and you're getting in trouble, you're, you're, li you're living life to the fullest is what it sounds like to me. I, I think so. And, and I was pretty straight laced, you know, I, I didn't mess around with, you know, I wasn't stealing stuff. I didn't do, you know, like smoking, drinking, those kind of things. I was, I was pretty straight laced. I just, uh, I, I just had a lot to, a lot to say. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that was kind of like my next question because a lot, lot of people who made or not, maybe troubled isn't the right word, but like have this sort of energy that they want to share. It does or, or get out. It, it can find its way into other other outlets even if it's just like either reading or writing creative outlets sports yeah. or like what how did you was there anything that you were like more focused on during middle school high school growing up well and by the way my suggestion is always and my parents did this too is get your kids involved in some sort of activities I and mean, if you could think back of the troublemakers in school for you know i don't think i was a troublemaker i was just getting in trouble there are troublemakers which are always just stirring the pot and doing stuff 
uh, those kids tended, I'm not saying it's always this way, but they tended to just not be doing much. They're not in, you know, the band sports or whatnot. They're just, they didn't have, they had a lot of free time on their hands to screw around and weren't being watched. So, uh, for me, my kids, they're, they're active. They, you know, too many sports they are all doing that. I was doing that too. I just love sports. Uh, so I, my, my dad played baseball. He coached baseball for years at the college. And so I, um, I played baseball, everything I could, I could do, rode my bike. I ended up doing that professional it's snow skiing. I mean, everything uh, we can possibly do, uh, played the piano, played the trumpet, uh, couldn't sing very well, but, uh, <laughs> you know, wow. yeah. Multi-talented person I'm talking to over there. What <laughs> kind of, what kind of music were you into, uh, growing up? So, well, there's two sides of it. So there's, um, I played the piano and I started taking lessons about six six years old and I played through college, um, I was horrible because my sisters were older and they would play and I just liked to, I could kind of play by ear. So I would hear that they had played a lot of the same stuff that I was, uh, end up playing was they had already done. So I didn't learn to read music real well. Uh, so I, but I love piano. I just love to pick stuff up and learn to play it. So I had two older sisters and I was really influenced early on with a lot of the pathetic, sappy, um, non-male type of music from the seventies, you know, the air supplies, Chicago, Kenny Rogers, uh, all this kind of stuff. I, I really loved and, and Barry Manilow. I'll admit it. Uh, anything with piano, uh, I especially enjoyed. So that makes sense. yeah. So there's a lot of that now looking now, then when I went into high school, I got into, you know, this, I was in high school, I graduated high school in 1989. So I was into, whatever was in at that time, a lot of, uh, Depeche mode, new order, you know, those kind of things were a little bit different. Um, and Van Halen, you know, I had a plethora of, of things and looking back when I go back through the eighties, I have this interesting collection of, you know, songs and uh, music that I really like. Like I said, the sappy stuff all the way to a little bit more of the harder stuff. Um, I still enjoy music. And, and then what I did with my kids is I pushed my music on them really hard. Cause I'm like, they could always adapt and find their own music that whatever's popular now, but I wanted to kind of get them uh, a sense of enjoying older music and, and it's worked. So, um, my son, you know, we listened to Pink Floyd together. We're both big Pink Floyd fans, uh, Muse and, and different things like that. So, um, so you didn't, uh, you, you weren't able to play Van Halen on piano though. Uh, well, yes, I can. I can play jump. jump. <laughs> play there, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it went, right. When 1984 came about, um, that, and then, um, it's 51 50, there was a bunch of different stuff, uh, that I could play that they had. So there you, <laughs> there you go. Were you already a big Van Halen fan at, at that point? Um, no, I, I've gone back and really enjoyed, uh, Van Halen, their, their first album, by the way, which is ridiculously good for a first album. You go back and you listen to it and you're like, Oh, there's, there's just amazing songs it's all awesome. over it. Yeah. Album. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. So I've appreciated them after the fact, uh, I didn't really get into that. I had a friend who was really big into them and he was a troublemaker. So I didn't always like the stuff he was, uh, following down. And, um, so anyway, I, yeah, I got into him after the fact. Did you have a favorite band growing up? Like out of all the <laughs> artists that we've mentioned or, or any of them jump out at you more than, more um, than others? I mean, yeah. Uh, U2 was, well, that was a little bit later on, but I was a real big hollow notes fan. So, uh, I don't know what that says, but I do have a lot of appreciation for them looking back as well. Daryl Hall, uh, extremely talented, uh, very good, um, blue, like not, I don't say blues types, but kind of that, uh, genre, you know, they played live at the Apollo, which you wouldn't think, uh, two really white boys would do. But uh, he he can belt it out. So I know they don't like it when you call them blue eyed soul. They they just uh, like to yeah. be for be preferred to be called uh, soul music or yeah. Philly soul or something yeah. like that. Whatever. Right. Does it matter that we have blue eyes or whatever? Yeah. But yeah, I, you you said you don't really sing much though. But you kind of like sounded like you grew up on a lot of the singer songwriter stuff. And obviously, yeah. Hall and Oates is a very powerful vocal yeah. uh, centric group. You probably can't sing. You're just being being. Uh, I can carry a tune uh, and there you go. But I'm, I'm, you're, I'm not going to be a, a lead singer of any sort. Yeah. You get one song on the album. Is that, is that what it is? Something like that. You get one or two. Uh, yeah. Not the lead singer, <laughs> maybe, you get, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I got, are you playing much these days? I was, other than maybe encouraging your, your kids kind of thing. Uh, I encourage them to play my, my uh, youngest, uh, cause I have two now that are in college. 
uh, and then a senior in high school and a junior in high school and the junior he's, uh, he's playing guitar playing really, he's just really learned, learned it quick. Uh, he used to play violin. So I think that's helped him. He, he was taking a, uh, just this year, he started a um, guitar class that they had at high school and he's just really gone, gone and excelled. Um, but, um, the, all the kids were played in the piano for a while. I didn't push it on him. Like it was, I, I almost hated it growing up. You know, he had to practice, you know, 45 minutes, an hour a day. It was just annoying and I didn't enjoy it. Um, but I've always been glad that I did it. Um, we do have a piano and I haven't played it much for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool that you're, 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 you know, keeping the music alive, so to speak in your family yeah. and, and exposing all your kids to, you know, these different outlets so they don't become, uh, troublemakers or at all. <laughs> they're not, the, I gather they're, they're not, uh, but you know, in any they're, way that they're all good are. kids. I must say, you know, especially, um, d during COVID, uh, I had a little problems with a few of the schools, like how they were dealing with uh, kids and masks and all that stuff. And I, I told my, my daughter, I, who's, a, she was a junior then or sophomore, but she's a senior now. I was like, as long as you're doing, your grades are good. I'm, I, I have your back. Cause she was getting in trouble for different things at school. And, um, I was like, um, I, any normal time you would be suing schools for abusing kids the way that they were doing, the way they were treating them. Uh, so I'm like, I have no respect for the school at this point. I respect my, and my kids almost, they, they like that you have their back in a sense. And, um, and I wasn't encouraged them to be, you know, anarchists or any kind, but to, to kind of speak out and to be the, the kind of person that they, they, they felt that they should be. So I've said my kids are, my, especially my daughter, she's going to probably be, I used to think that I was raising, um, leaders, but I've realized I'm raising like thought criminals at some point. They'll be in jail. Fine or, line. Yeah. <laughs> so or, fine or, line. Can, or it can be two. you know, two things can be true. Right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> probably true. Well, at least your, your daughters, um, sounds like they're rebelling against the school on the side of justice and with purpose. Whereas, yeah. whereas yourself may have not been, uh, <laughs> there right. was, there was no method to the madness. There was no, no. reason. It, well, being it was, <laughs> it, it, you know, today they would say you're trying to get clicks or something. I was just trying to get laughs. That's you really were a you real time troll, right? <laughs> real, real time, real yeah. time trolling. What about in, uh, in high school? Where did, where, where did you have plans for after, after high school, college work? And what was, where was, where were we going? Where was life um, headed? I, I went to the high school right there from where, where I grew up for my first two years, had like a weird girlfriend thing my sophomore year and my sister had gone away to this other school. It was uh, like, I think I mentioned early on, uh, just South of Santa Cruz is, um, it was private school. And, um, so I was like, I want to go there. So I, I had to pay for it. So my grandma, my grandma helped me and I went there my dad did not like that because I played basketball and, and everything and he liked to you know come and watch my games and so this was not going to happen now that i'm you know uh, hours away several hundred miles uh what, how many 500 miles or so i think that's what it is up to At the college Northeast. this was college no this is high school oh this was high school yeah so my junior year in high school i went to a boarding school co-ed so i mean of course um and it was awesome so i just thought i would i don't know i didn't have a designs on what i was going to be in life i kind of I didn't say struggled my first two years of high school, but I just was playing basketball. I was doing everything else, skateboarding, whatever. I uh, wasn't really focusing on school. And then I go to this other school in California and uh, they're big. They were really big in academics. And I was like, okay, whatever. I was kind of, I was actually struggling for the first time ever in my junior year. Uh, and then I started dating this girl and she was really good in everything in school and in, in you know, math, science. She's just super smart, pretty, and we got competitive to the point where I started to want to, you know, do better than her and, and all my friends. And so I suddenly became figured out that I was good at math and I took, you know, trigonometry, analytical geometry, all these high school classes that I never would have expected and um, did the aptitude test. And it said I should be a, an engineer. And, you know, and so that I ended up going to college for engineering. And I never would have done that if I hadn't gone to the school. I probably would have just, you know, been a PE teacher. Nothing wrong with that. But um, I didn't really even understand that what my mom had said when I was young, that, you know, you're, you're smart. Uh, I never really actually experienced that. So it was, it was good for me. Interesting interaction with that, with that, with that girl to, to right. push you to... Right. I mean, usually, 
I thought the goal was just to impress uh, impress them, but to actually want to surpass them and and compete with them. I never thought that far ahead. <laughs> I, you know, looking back, it's not, even as I was telling the story, I'm like, really, dude, this seems uh, ridiculous. But um, you know, those are the things that she cared about. So suddenly, those are the things that <laughs> I was caring about. I thought, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I I follow. I follow. Yeah. Uh, I, interesting enough, we went to the same college, and she figured out she liked to uh, sleep with other guys. So, oh, uh, I did not figure that out till. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I do- should we dox her or or have <laughs> have bygones been bygones? No, I, I I've I've seen her again. Um, I, she got her she got her own. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, All right. part of the journey and, and your journey and her journey, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I, I saw her at my high school reunion and we're, we're friends and it's, it's perfectly fine. So um, my life's, you know, everything is, it's even like I have an ex-wife and you're like, oh, whatever. But I had two kids out of that. So you can't, you know, want to say you want to relive your life and uh, you wouldn't have, now you wouldn't know you don't have those kids, but those are the kids you know now. So, um, you know, you got to take everything as it comes and learn from them. And, uh, you know, not make those similar mistakes. And I made mistakes with her. And as you know, I mean, I was a teenager. Sure. But you have, it sounds like you have a lot of love from other people in your life with yeah. family and, and yeah. beyond that. And you're receiving and giving a lot of love in your life. And from what I understand that, that, that can be kind of important. Oh, tremendously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this is probably have with, uh, you know, and I have teenage kids that, you know, go and going a 22 year old, you know, so kids are going through stuff in relationships and the first time they have this breakup and it's sadness. Um, you know, a lot of times when you do have teenage suicide, it's because they don't understand the ups and downs of relationships. So this first breakup is, is pretty harsh and they don't really understand that you get through it. And I had, you know, my parents, um, my, I would talk to my mom when, when shit would go wrong with, with, uh, girlfriends and she was really great. And, um, so those things always, always were helpful. So, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, it's sad that not everybody has that in, in their lives and we all try to, you know, work our way and get through, but yeah, uh, definitely a support group is, is huge. Yeah, that's great. And I can tell that you appreciate your family and your mom and your dad and your, and your kids and all that. You did not become an engineer though. Or did I you? Did. You did. So I did. Yeah. I, I got an engineering degree, mechanical, um, then speak, I always had girl trouble, uh, a girl I dated mostly through high, through college, a different one. Uh, we broke up like spring break before we were graduating. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And I'd already applied to all these grad schools. I was going to follow her. And then the only one I got into that wasn't anywhere near her, like she was going to California, uh, was in Colorado. So university, university of Colorado. So, uh, I went out there for grad school and, uh, yeah, I, I, for engineering. Sad story there is I didn't finish it. I did a year got <laughs> of grad school and I uh, got, I was really big into bike racing and it was Boulder, Colorado. And it's like the Hollywood for bike racing. And so I, I got in a team, I actually ra- raced on their uh, club team for the school uh, national championships that year. And we, we won that and then um, just went and did stuff, other things, which was professional cycling did that for multiple years until got married and had a kid. So that was a, that was a, so I didn't really work as an engineer much. Um, I did it for, um, one year after I was done with bike racing. Uh, yeah, about a year and a half. So. Gotcha. Well, what, where, where did, where did you end up doing after the, the engineering or. In- so I got 94. Four, so when I graduated college and went to grad school and started racing, I did that through 2000 and then started to work in Colorado. Um, actually, is that the end of that season? There was, let me just tell you, bike racing in the U.S. is not, you know, if you know anything about it, you think of like the Tour de France and that's kind of, you know, the Lance Armstrong stuff. And that's part of that world that I was in. Uh, but I, we were mostly in the U.S., so it would be more like uh, like a, a minor league team. You know, if you're, Hey, you're a professional baseball player, but you're, you're not, you know, with the Yankees, you're with the farm team out in Ohio, uh, that kind of stuff. But for us, we got to do a lot of racing together. So we, we raced against the big guys and I did some trips over to Europe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you're always struggling to get money for your team. And then the team, the guy that owned it, he had tax trouble. (laughs) So he had some of these problems. 
Uh, so I was, I decided I needed to get a, a real job. And uh, even though I was getting paid for that, um, something more substantial. So I ended up working uh, in this, what's called the American Galvanizing Association. I was doing research on hot dipped. You take metal, you dip it in zinc and it coats it for, um, you know, protecting it, towers, guardrails, all those kind of things. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. And then my wife and I, we decided to move. We had a newborn, uh, moved out to call it, uh, California and, um, then I didn't have a job as an engineer, so I had to find something else. So I have got this unique thing. That I just keep doing different jobs, and, and I went into uh, day trading and worked for a company, a, a, a brokerage firm. I got all my licenses, and I started doing um, uh, trade disputes. So market maker and the customers have an issue with the trade. I deal with the back office and the markets and the companies trying to resolve these and set them up for uh, arbitrage or, or not arbitrage, but, um, uh, anyway, wh where you, instead of going to court, you go and, and you try to resolve all the issues there. Small uh, ar claims, arbitration, arbitration, sorry. arbitration. Yeah. Uh, and so then that kind of got me into law and then next thing you know, I went to law school. Um, so yeah, I'm skipping around here for a lot of things, but that's um, all right. Yeah. If anything catches your fancy, you can dig into this stuff, but, uh, that's, uh, that was that progression. So I was working in the stock market on 9-11, uh, going into the office here in California, because uh, I'd get into the office, you know, before six o'clock, and we were driving there, listening to Howard Stern, and when I heard the first tower go down, and then we're in there watching it, and the second one. So the stock market in 9-11, I mean, that's, you know, they, they, obviously the markets were closed for, for weeks, and it was a big deal, and uh, I only mention that because 9-11, stock market, it was just kind of intertwined at the time because, you know, supposedly that was, you know, George Bush comes on and says, you know, go spend money and, you know, buy stocks. So um, that was, that was an interesting time. Wow. That's, that's amazing that you've had all these like careers and worn different hats <laughs> and like, it, it, are you just, a, I mean, you must be a very curious person who wants to, to, to learn. And obviously having a family drives you to, to achieve, to support your family and all that. But it, was it was it easy for you to like become an engineer and then become a or or become a, then get into the stock stuff and the legal stuff because that's like such a big commitment to like get your licenses and do all that it seems like overwhelming like how do you know you're gonna love doing it enough to make it worth your while to like learn it but you just is it that you just enjoy the learning process or that's such a big part of it that you're have good reading comprehension and that you're like learning become is kind of natural to you like what what is, what is I think, that all like you know that's that's a really good question i think some of it looking back was just me not knowing what i wanted to do so i'm i'm going to go to college and oh engineering oh you know and some of it is and i wouldn't say status but um like people all my friends growing up so they i go away and, and some of them have moved away and then you reconnect and they're like wait you're you're an engine you went to engineering you know this is not the tyler we knew while i said school wasn't difficult for me i wasn't like lighting things on fire you know like like showing off there was definitely not the smartest kid in the class um i went to school with a lot of kids that dads were you know dads and moms were professors at this so i went to get in this town i lived in had like three colleges so there's a lot of like professors kids or whatever you know kids that work there and my parents weren't um, so there was a lot of smart kids and a lot of parents who really pushed their kids like that. And my, like I said, my biggest push was my mom's like, yeah, you, you, you don't have to study as much as your sisters. Okay. I don't know if you know if that's really pushing you. So, yeah. That's the opposite. Right. Almost. Hey, you've got it easy. Um, but so some of the things I've done, I, it's almost like I'm trying to prove that I could do these kind of things, which isn't necessarily smart. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, what's okay. So I went through engineering and engineering was so law school wasn't easy, especially taking the bar. Uh, engineering was really tough. I mean, you, it's, it's not just memorizing. It's like figuring out all these different things you've got to, you know, and understand it. And, and so that was, that was rough as well. But, um, it's one thing that all these things have done for me. Cause I'm, I'm settled now. I'm a, I'm an attorney. It's what I love to do. And all these different things have helped me along the way, either making you understand law school as an example, you're going there, you're taking a class and you've got a classmate that says um, that, oh, this class is really tough. You know, this person that took it last year, they didn't pass or they, they had a tough time. And then I remember, yeah, but I went through engineering and there's always, you never know. This person could be good at something and bad at another. So I don't want to take what someone else has had a tough time 
and influence me. And so a lot of these things in, in life in general, it's the same way, which is, um, you know, if you don't do something and you don't pass or you figure, if you need to do the same study and for the next time, you're going to probably have the same results. So you've got to figure out different ways. So all these little things I've done along the way, whether I even use them now, uh, they helped me, I think. Uh, and, and what's the ultimate thing? Is it to, you know, have this great career or is it to kind of be a good dad and, a, and a, have a you know good marriage and, and wonderful kids? And so I think all those things have kind of helped me I tell you what you have four kids going, going through school, you know, from, you know, kindergarten through college. And, um, I can always help them with their math. They have not <laughs> surpassed me. Uh, so that's been, that's been a huge thing. You know, when the kids come home and there's always a problem, it's like, well, I, I sadly I can figure it out. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been, uh, it's been good for that reason. Interesting, interesting, uh, uh, journey, um, for, for sure. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna, what I was just gonna ask you. Um, oh, I remember, um, political stuff. When, when did you sort of, um, become politically aware, politically active? Did, was that way earlier? Have we not crossed that, that bridge yet? When did, when did politics become more of an interest in, in your life? I remember my parents, um, my, I wouldn't say my parents were really political, but they were always politically conscious. Um, they would have even debates with their friends about, uh, I remember Nixon uh, issues. So, you know, I, I was born in 71. So, you know, later in life, they're, they're talking about stuff and I remember it and having a lot of their friends were, like I said, professors and college people. So a lot of lefties, my parents were not, they were more right. And I remember the, the, the Carter, uh, Reagan election, um, uh, so that was the first time I was really, you know, and, and by the way, it's always so humorous when looking back and I remember the feelings at the time, uh, I actually remember, um, well, there's a few other, uh, just elections that would happen and your guy wouldn't win. And I'd be like, when you're young and, but my parents like this person, why, why would this guy not win if my parents were, you know, <laughs> for this person? And it was like, kind of would blow me away. Uh, but I distinctly remember those kind of feelings. And then you start to understand that, oh, okay, well, just because my parents like them doesn't mean everybody's should. But it's it's kind of the whole thing where, you know, your kids are arguing about, you know, whose dad's the best fisherman type of thing. You know, your cat, dad can't do wrong, at least in my perspective, because my dad was great and my mom was great. So therefore, you know, you're believing everything uh, that they're saying, which also, by the way, um, leads to different things you get influenced by from your teachers, because it's that same kind of mentality of they're um, in charge, they know all. And so you just kind of go along that. And for me, I had a lot of that busted up early along when I would like push back against the teacher. And, you know, when we had these push and pull, and it's almost like you wouldn't have debates in class, you would have um, roast battles. That's really what I was, what I was doing starting in second grade, which means you're not really respecting a teacher, um, which means you don't, when they tell you about other things, you kind of like, uh, you know, it's, and so anyway, I do remember, um, politics from early on. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was, a, I was a right winger, you would say. Through, through most of your, like growing up, like even if you weren't like super politically active, you kind of like identified with, with being on the right for the most part. Yeah, I I, uh, I remember was it eighth grade. We did like these mock elections of the governor for Washington, and you know I took on the Republican. He lost. Uh, in high school, I, I was also you know in, involved, uh, interested in politics. wasn't really big into any of that stuff. College, I was more and more just kept kind of building. You know, then I, I mean I'd get in my car, you know, after my dad would would take it or something, and he'd have on AM radio, and I'd be like, oh, oh, of course, my dad's always listened to some you know sports radio or uh, I don't even Rush Limbaugh wasn't around at the time, but it'd be like politics. And then when I went to Boulder, is when I really uh, kind of came into my own. Um, I started to listen to talk radio there. And I was, when I went there was in grad school and Boulder is just this liberal, it's more of a state of mind than a place that you live in you know, the city. And, uh, politics were, were all encompassing there. And, uh, I just really got more and more into that. And yeah, was a right winger up until, uh, 2016 is when I went over to being a libertarian and kind of quit the, the Republican party. And, um, it's also shortly, I'd met my wife in 2012 
and she was a she considered herself a libertarian and i was very open to that kind of mentality anyway so we just kind of kept drawing closer together on our on our politics and so yeah that's that's where i am now i, I probably consider myself an, an anarcho-capitalist but um you know it's it's the libertarian the way for me at this point In interesting and i'm guessing that like uh that your town in Washington and then in, and obviously you described the politics of Boulder being very left. So were you kind of a, a political minority being more conservative Republican, like in the, in those places? I, I, the thing is I, I'm asking you about it, but back then it was not uh, the same political climate no. and as polarizing <clears throat> then. So like you may probably were not demonized, even if you were maybe, you know, poked yeah. fun at by, people on the left or something like what, what what was were you a political minority back in those times i i would assume so although it was the eastern washington so you get away from seattle and it's a small right. town you know it's a college town so you once again you have some of that more liberal idea in there but even then um it you're so removed from the other parts of especially at the time that even some of the friends that you would consider more liberal they weren't because it's still just that rational uh farmer town mentality in a sense uh, that really ruled the day, and and for us, it was a uh, one of the town, one of the colleges there is a Christian college, so you just get a little bit different mentality with that. Even though they might be somewhat liberal, uh, they're still conservative in a sense, and their their personal lives. So you know, you, you, it, it it was it was a little different as far as that a political minority there. Uh, probably not. Although, you know, like I said, I remember distinctly you know, two of my good friends. Their parents were definitely liberals, and um, my parents had discussions with them and, but it wasn't raucous and rowdy. It was just, you know, disagreements at the time. Yeah. Uh, who knows what it'd be now though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'd be, it'd be much, yeah. much different as we, we are well aware. Um, you mentioned your wife and then you mentioned 2016 was sort of when you, you were cemented as like having a, a libertarian, uh, you know, view or, or politics, whatever. Um, what was it about um, that time specifically? Are you saying you're you were not the biggest fan, perhaps, of Donald Trump and or Hillary Clinton? Did that did that play a part in it? What 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 was going on then? It, yeah, <laughs> it did. Well, no, yeah, it, it did. And and like I said, when I met my wife, I was uh, when I immediately told her I was uh, you know conservative at the time. She's like, oh, gross, and I'm a <laughs> libertarian. And I was, but I was like, oh, I was like, oh, try, hey. I, I'm, I understand your world, and I had a lot of sympathies to that. I, I'd, I'd read Bast yet uh, back in you know, before 2000, and I just thought it was fantastic. And so there was a, Ayn Rand. I'd read uh, Atlas Shrugged multiple times, actually, uh, even though she technically is not a libertarian. She definitely has that window to people there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was very favorable, and I was already starting to have disillusions. So 2016 comes around. Uh, little backstory. I told you I went to this uh, high school in, um, it's called Monterey Bay Academy. It's it's uh, closer to Santa Cruz though than it is uh, Monterey actually. Um, and one of the girls that was in a class behind me is, uh, her name is Heidi Cruz, which is Ted Cruz's wife at the time it was Heidi Nelson. Uh, so I, you know, he's Senator. I was like, oh, interesting. And then he's running for, for president. And I was a fan of his kind of he was an attorney. He was an attorney general. I, he was, you know, a good guy, I thought. And so I, he was he was kind of the guy I was pulling for. Um, and then there's Trump. And Trump, I, I never hated Trump. I was not a never Trumper. But I did have problems with uh, a lot of, I didn't think he was very consistent on things. My my problem with him a lot is, and I still think it's, it is, is he's um, he didn't really have a lot of policy differences. It was always a lot of, I can do this better because I am Trump. And I'm like, well, then you're just saying that the policy is still fine. Uh, now, there's obviously, obviously some differences uh, between him and other people. So anyway, um, when Ted Cruz was officially uh, knocked out, um, I decided I wasn't really that hung up on Cruz either, but I didn't like the Republican Party. And I switched my um, registration to Libertarian that day. So that was kind of my, my little thing to do. And uh, I've not regretted it. And then there's the typical thing. I wanted more and more about, uh, to learn about it. So I start digging away. And, you know, six months later, I go from like uh, libertarian-ish conservative to full anarchist. <laughs> so There's no, yeah, there's no putting the the cat back in the bag, you know, regardless of what you ultimately label yeah. you give, one gives themselves. But when you view the world in such a way where you kind of like, 
don't know. I think we have a pretty good eye for BS and injustice and yeah. the abuse of of government and 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 what what comes about. You know, in terms of that, we're all learning and evolving, and don't know entirely how the world works, but certainly can understand concepts like the military-industrial complex and the flaws of the monetary system. So it's like once you kind of like get hip to all these things, you can't like you can't like go back. Like like anyone who says they go from libertarian to something else, I don't really believe that you were ever a libertarian, at least in the sense that you're, um, you know red pilled on government and understand the true nature of what government is like i don't, I don't believe that that's a thing people go back and the uh go or at least don't go back to being a, a a blue pilled mainstream you know republican or democrat maybe you'll become some sort of other you know uh and uh you know have other some other view outside of the establishment but no one ever goes back to being a normie mainstream person i don't believe that exists yeah i i think you're right I, even the ones that kind of go on that paleo route where they're definitely, you know, they're talking about it because it's a power structure. Uh, they still have, uh, they're not your typical neocons type. So um, I do have my questions about some of those people. And by the way, the, the Trump thing that really got me, and I'm not a prude at all, and I, I was really big in politics in the, in the, when Clinton was around. Uh, so Clinton goes out, diddles Monica Lewinsky, gets in trouble, and he's like, oh, it's just a... You know, it's a personal thing. You shouldn't, you know, uh, condemn me for this. And the Republicans, you know, impeach. Uh, then Trump goes out and, uh, oh, and by the way, the left was all like, hey, it's perfectly fine. It's just his personal life. Then Trump goes out and they, you know, catch him on tape about, uh, you know, uh, grabbing him by the pussy. And the right immediately is like, oh, come on, this is nothing. And the left is like, oh, this is the worst thing ever. And I don't think I was necessarily disillusioned as, you know, by the, the left does what they do. They, they flop. But I was like, you know, you guys made a whole big deal, the right, about Clinton. And I, I didn't necessarily have a problem with that at the time. Uh, looking back, I'm like, like eh, maybe there's some problems. Uh, but I was the way that they flipped back and forth was just so easy based on whoever is in power. And then you start to dig down every little thing with wars, you know, Bosnian war they were against, but Afghanistan they're for, you know, it just depends because Clinton was in power and then, you know, someone else is in power. So this flip flopping, um, I just got tired of that. And by the way, it is such a relief. I just met with a client today. Uh, he's talking about he had been cheating on his wife for years. She finally found out and she found he she found out because the girlfriend finally went and told the wife and he had been trying to keep these things separate for years. And it was almost like a relief that he was like, ah, OK, I don't have to live this way anymore. Right. And that's wow. kind of the way I felt with this, which is, ah, I could just have a principled life and continue down this path. I could be against this and this. And, and I used to think those were the people, the, the centrist that didn't, you know, d held their finger up in the hair and like, well, which way is the wind blowing? That's how I'm going to make this decision this day. And I'm like, but that's not really what I am doing. I'm just like, here's my principles and the wind can blow around me, but I'm always going this direction. And, um, you know, Dave Smith, the great podcaster talks about uh, being a libertarian is kind of like a superpower. And I really felt that at the time, which was such a relief of like, I can go to my lefty friends. I can have complete things in common with them and then my righty friends and I have things in common with them and just I'm I'm a different person and by the way it always blows them away because they assume as soon as you have a disagreement with something that you're immediately on you're either lefty or righty and they they can't grasp uh this third way in a sense um so yeah that's that's my politics now that's so well said and I appreciate you oh, sa thanks. saying all that what a what a great great monologue spiel that you went on and I'm all I'm all here for it and love to listen to to stuff like that and you're preaching to the to the choir of course in some ways like hearing people talk about their political views of course ones that I agree with it does kind of sound like in a way I'm almost like listening to music in a way like mm. the way like these like sort of natural organic ideas that that are uh pure and beautiful as like dave smith uh who you just mentioned uh has described the ideas like this this you know i don't say ideological pure ground to stand on but certainly we have some sort of foundation for our our world view yeah and so many people are out there do not and and the democrat and republican parties and and of course mislead people but like yeah there's a lot of people lost out there and don't have a world view and are looking for an identity and looking for a purpose 
And that can be very easily taken advantage of by everyone in society. And, and it's tough out there, but yeah. we're, we're, we're lucky. I think in a sense that we kind of like have a certain like uh, grounding to, I think, the party now and the broader movement and all and all that like i don't know i can't speak for for your journey but like even when i started to like my political views like were shifting and becoming more libertarian it was all like ron paul 2012 was kind of like my the impetus for that but it was more emotional i feel like at the time and maybe it's that way for other people in terms of like wanting to convert everyone you meet and and if someone disagrees with you you're like appalled and shocked and doing your best to convert them and you're emotional about it but now i feel like we're a little bit more like as a movement and as a party like in maybe even individually just a little bit more like measured in our responses and we don't get rattled by every like the world does still surprise me yeah it surprises yeah. me almost daily uh, or i i suppose but i think what it doesn't surprise me to the point where i'm like shocked by a lot of things and like i think we're able to handle the you know it helps to be lucky and fortunate but i think the fact that we have this like ideological principle ground to stand on we're able to look at the world and sort of at least do our best to assess what the issue is, how can we fix it, what can we do to to make the world a better place, I suppose, something like that. No, yeah, and, and by the way, I don't ever want to um, compare um, politics or you know political affiliations with religion, but there are some... There are some comparison types, uh, such as, you know, just understanding the basics. And by the way, you know, when you kind of get interested in this is the same with religion. If you're interested in it, you start to dig further and further and further in. And politics is, and philosophy is is a similar way as well. But it's it's good to be grounded in something. And I think the libertarian way, uh, similar, is just you have a philosophy. And it's, if you have this grounding as to what it is. Me personally, it's easy to live my life that way too. Now, there's the real world out there and, you know, factors and government and all these, you know, evil things going on, you know, COVID 2020 and all that thing. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily sacrifice all everything to to get. A, now, I'm in a different position than some people because I own my own business. So, you know, the COVID thing, as an example, uh, didn't hit me in the same way. And I could take stands. Uh, that other people possibly couldn't. And, um, but yeah, it, if you can live your life that way, and by the way, I think it's easier for me to, to be religious and a libertarian and to live that kind of life. And I, I'm lucky that I have a wife that just agrees with, <laughs> agrees with me now that we have, we see eye to eye on these things. So, you know, we can kind of live that way. It is an easy way to sell. Once again, it'd be similar to religion of you live a life. Some people just ask you about, oh, you know, they're interested in your philosophy because of how you just live your life um, or, you know, different things you do. And you're not a hypocrite. And that's kind of the big thing for me is, uh, you know, you cannot be a hypocrite and uh, kind of get get through all this. Um, so that's once again, I, I don't want to necessarily compare it to religion, but there I just did. No, that's that's OK. And I'm going to write that down. Don't don't be a hypocrite. Uh, and also, I think, um, also set an example for people and do not force them to do things. I think those are yeah. those are those are the, the, the three main things I'm kind of right. like getting out of that. Um, I feel like I've taken up a lot of your time already, my friend. Um, what else do we do? We need do we need to, to cover? Is there anything else that that you like to, to mention or, or, or re revisit? I have I have one more question that I uh, okay. Sur okay. Kind of survey it's question. Your show. Yeah. OK, OK. Um, I ask everyone if they believe in ghosts and aliens and if they've had any experiences with, with either um, UFOs or, or otherwise. What's what's the ghosts and aliens on your end? Uh, no, I don't necessarily believe in that. Well, I, I don't know. You know, like I said, I'm religious, but yet I don't I believe there's you know phenomenon out there. Um, I haven't experienced anything that would make me believe that it would ghosts and or aliens, but I don't. I'm not so, um, I wouldn't say naive, but I'm not just so uh, full of myself that uh, I don't think that those things couldn't be out there. I think that's that's kind of the wonder of, of the world in general. Um, so I, I don't know. I haven't just had any experiences that would lead me to believe that there are. So I'm, I'm kind of open to it all. I kind of hope there is. Um, 
it's just weird that we've, they, I mean, maybe they look at us and they're like, <laughs> We don't want to, We don't want to conquer that. That's that's a crap heap that we don't want to. Maybe get we don't have what they want or need. It's yeah. simply that. And yeah. Maybe it's not that we're stupid and we suck. It yeah. just could be like, oh, we're not. We don't drink water or eat what? pizza. We we drink other stuff and eat other food. They well, I, you know, and I say, oh, I don't believe in ghosts. Yet I do. You know, and growing up, you, if you're religious, you're kind of believing in these these realms of like good and evil that kind of pull against you. So what's the difference? I mean, one, I I don't know. So they, it could be. All of that as well. I don't know. Um, tell you the truth, it doesn't s really fascinate me to the to that much. Um, I'm just not. Um, I don't know, I'm curious, but I am kind of that kind of engineer type that uh, I want to see concrete things, and so some things you just can't explain. Yeah, and I think also like a factor probably is that you have family and business and a life and lots of things going on. So who the fuck has time to think about if ghosts <laughs> or aliens exist? But um, if you if you had to bet on one more than the other, I, I mean, I guess aliens is probably more likely because the universe is so vast. I would say I would actually pick the other. I would say that if one does exist, it might be ghosts simply because uh, I think if there were aliens, we would probably have a little bit more of, you know, run into one. You know, you can actually see it something there, whereas ghosts, it's hard to prove one way or another. And, you know, you hear stories that are like I, I've heard people that have I, I knew a guy that went and it was uh, hitchhiking and he spent the night in um, at Gettysburg sleeping on the grounds. And he's like, there, I'm not believing ghosts, but good Lord, something is happening here all around me all night long. And so, yeah, that'd be, that's weird. I don't want to, and I don't know. <laughs> I used to, I'm becoming more and more cause I don't know something about what you believe as an individual I think that shapes reality. And I always think about that particle experiment or whatever, when they shot the particles and they behaved differently or whatever, mm. when they were being watched versus when they were not being watched. So just that alone fucking trips me out and just yeah. like makes me wonder how much power we have in the eyes and the ears and the senses right. and the brains and of the, of, you know, of, you know, in, in ourselves and, and the, as far as the beholder or whatever. But, um, on that note, um, why don't you tell me about your 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 podcast or what other creative things you're you're working? I'll give you the floor to do that and, and plug and promote. And, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. So first of all, Adam, I just want to say thanks for having me on. Um, I I did watch, by the way, I watched your trailer or your 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 short movie. my short film short film, and um, I was very impressed. So um, you know, it comes out and I'm like, I look at it and I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll check this out. And uh, I was just very impressed. It seemed like I it was very well professionally done, and, and I enjoyed it. It was uh, short and uh, precise and, and succinct. Uh, do you have more of those coming out? I want to. I'm I'm working on. It. I'm I'm in the in the writer's lab right now. Is okay. kind of where kind of where we're at, and trying to get trying to get the short out there and get and myself in the writers in the writer's lab. That's where where we're at. Well, I, it, just in comparison, I'm not much of a creator, so it's nice you you, th you said what are you creating? I'm not really doing. It. I I have a podcast, uh, Libertarian Podcast Review. Uh, the idea is to and you know started this thing. I wanted to figure out how could I could most uh, do what I want, which is kind of what you're doing here. Just talk to people. I think that's the most fun. Uh, but I needed a way to uh, something different. So I was like, oh, I'm going to review. I, I always listen to talk radio, and I'm going to review podcasts. So I was reviewing people's podcasts. It takes a lot of work. You listen to all their shows, and then you put out a show about it, and you play clips. Um, but then what you can do is you can talk to those podcast hosts. So, you know, you put this on and then actually when I first did that, people are like, Oh, I'll come in your show. You just reviewed my show. And then, so it, it, it helps. Um, so that's my show. I, I do it uh, often with, uh, Andy, um, a friend of mine, a garbage main on Twitter. Uh, so it's, we do a kill podcast type of knockoff too. It's, if you've ever seen kill Tony, it's kind of like that. Uh, but it's with uh, politics or podcasts or whatever, um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of what, uh, I just, I love going on shows and talking about politics and, and libertarian stuff, uh, keeping things light. And, uh, so one of the best things we do is sometimes just someone has a, a podcast and they have it, it just happens to do with reason magazine a lot, <laughs> but they, they put in an interview with some libertarian that hates libertarians and, you know, bring on a guest and we just kind of critique it. That's uh, that's a lot of fun as well. Yeah. Reason can sometimes or often be very very easy to to critique but we, we give them their flowers too when they're yeah. when they're earned um i didn't know who the fuck andy was but i definitely recognize the name garbage main 
Say what say what you will about that. I'm like, I'm like, Andy, do I have another person? Oh, garbage main. I've seen that name on, yeah. on podcast before. Uh, he's a, he, he's uh, this is what I love. So I've got we just talked about it. I've got way too much education in my life. He is a high school dropout, and literally. And when we talk, there's so many things that I defer to him on because he's just super smart. And um, so it, it, it blows my mind. But these are the kind of things I love about people. You know, um, Andy, just he drives a garbage truck and he reads Mises and all these things. And he just knows what he's talking about. So uh, just because you have a title behind your name or you've got a lot of education doesn't mean you're smart. Just don't know. No, and, and educational resources and educational access is like being more and more De decentralized and i can't help but think about uh michael malice's upcoming book the white pill he was talking about it a little bit earlier on yeah. on tim cast and i wonder if that will be a part of the book as far as like a reason for optimism is that education has become so decentralized and right. with homeschooling and, and charter schools and private schools and just just different options and more s specific skills people are able to learn and learning from home and just like new networks coming about it's like it seems like that would be a real hope for optimism that like we're, we can get away from this model where you have to go into debt for hundreds of thousands of dollars and come out with a degree that's right. going to give you nothing and and put you behind the eight ball for quite some time it's like we need to look at the world in a different way in education but on that note where can people find and follow uh <laughs> the libertarian uh review that's what it's called uh, so that's what it's called right Libertarian podcast review. Uh, podcast probably the review. easiest is to find me on Twitter. It's just my name, T Y L E R J A N K E. Um, I do have a sub stack. I try to put everything there so you can find all the links to everything there. It's Tyler Yonke, sub stack. Tyler Yonke. Um, and I also do some writing there. I'm trying to do, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm a family law attorney. So I'm, I try to put out some legal analysis stuff every once in a while, kind of in a lighthearted manner. Uh, especially stuff on family law because the courts are crazy. And from a libertarian perspective, that's a tough world to get through. So I'm starting to work on, on a few of those kind of things. So yeah, find me there, follow me, uh, check out our show and, uh, and obviously uh, check your stuff out as well. Um, big fan. So I appreciate, oh, I appreciate that. And yeah. on Twitter, it's at Tyler, you're at your name. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. T Y L E R J A N K E. That's correct. Very cool. Well, I'll let you get on the rest with the rest of your evening. Um, I appreciate the time and uh, let's talk soon. All right. Thanks, Adam. We well, got it later. So there you have it. Episode 134 and my conversation with Tyler Yonke. That was fun. I definitely appreciate his time and I could definitely uh, picture myself laughing uh, at his jokes in school if we uh, were in a class together in a different lifetime. Um, his family seems pretty cool, too. Uh, I feel like I didn't ask enough questions about biking, actually. That sport is insane and looks uh, pretty hard. Anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com, at peoplewelovepodcast on Instagram. I am at Adam Choit on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, my other podcast is Tedeschi Trucks Podcast, at Tedeschi Trucks Podcast, T-E-D-E-S-C-H-I Trucks Podcast, all about the 12-piece blues rock soul powerhouse band, Tedeschi Trucks Band. The edited movie.com for my short film that I wrote and directed. But I think that's about all I got for today. I definitely appreciate you guys listening and for all the support. Uh, let's talk soon. Peace. <laughs>